Welcome to a special 15-year anniversary episode of Stories from the NNI. I'm Lisa Friedersdorf, Director of the National Nanotechnology Coordination Office. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Julia Greer, Professor of Material Science, Mechanics, and Medical Engineering at Caltech. Julia's group creates strong ultralight materials by capitalizing on the hierarchical design of three-dimensional architectures constructed from nano-sized solids. Julia, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you first got involved in nanotechnology? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you so much for interviewing me, and thank you so much for having this discussion my training is in material science. So I got my PhD degree from Stanford University in material science department. I actually switched from chemical engineering, which was my major in undergrad. And when I was working on my PhD, my advisor suggested that I take on this one project that he had in mind. And it's working with these very, very small metallic materials, which we called nanopillars. They're tiny, tiny cylinders, which can be made out of a variety of different metals, which I created myself. And we discovered that they had quite unique properties. For example, they were much stronger than we would anticipate. They were much more deformable than we would anticipate. They had very different response to defects. And so all of that became very interesting and unique to us. And because of that, I became more and more interested in understanding materials at these length scales. And so that PhD research inspired me to look more deeply into the behavior of materials at the nanoscale and then trying to see if we could somehow make it be useful. Because one thing that the scientists do is they try to understand and discover particular phenomena and maybe to explain it. And then one thing that the engineers do is that is to take some kind of a phenomenon like that and then to make it be useful and to maybe incorporate it into a device or to, or to start building things with it or to somehow engineer something that doesn't yet exist. And so the combination of both of these pursuits is what in many ways inspires and drives my research now, which in many ways involves both nanotechnology and nanoscience. Julia, can you tell us a little bit more about your research on nano-architected materials? Sure. So what we do in my group for the most part is we create materials that are nano-architected and they're hierarchical in many ways. And the reason why we call them that is because they have different length scales all incorporated into them. So say you take a regular material, like a brick or a piece of metal, and you start zooming into it. So you break it in half and then in half and then in half, and you keep on dividing it until eventually you get to the atoms, which you can't really split. So in those conventional materials that we're very used to, the first level of, of hierarchy or the first level of organization is called a microstructure. So in a metal, it would be something that we call a grain. Now, what we do in our group is we add an extra level of hierarchy. So if you were to zoom into our materials, before you get to that microstructure, you would see maybe something like a beautiful lattice or some kind of Eiffel Tower-like truss-like construct, which is much smaller than what your eye can discern. Some, sometimes, actually, you can see it, but sometimes they can be made very, very small. And that's what brings about these unique properties because all of our architectures are very open. And so they can be comprised of many, many different beams, for example, like a truss would be. And the diameter of those beams can be smaller than one micron. And then their lengths might be on the order of several microns. And the whole thing may be something like 99% air, if not more. So they're very, very open, and therefore they're very, very lightweight. But the largest dimension of any solid, wherever you zoom in, is just the dimensions of those beams. Or if those beams are made as straws, for example, so they have a certain wall thickness, that's your largest dimension. Well, that wall thickness can be on the order of five to 10 nanometers. So that's very, very small. So now imagine a structure that's comprised entirely of straws, like the plastic straws that we use for drinking. But now these straws are made out of a variety of different materials. They can be ceramics, they can be metals, they can be glasses, they can be semiconductors, any class of material. And now, because their dimensions are reduced to these nanometer size dimension, and like I mentioned earlier, it's at that scale, at the nanoscale, when all these interesting properties emerge, these solids that are comprised of these nanoscale building blocks now exhibit this kind of behavior. So they harness all the beneficial properties that are offered by the nanoscale, but now at much larger overall global dimensions. 
Could you talk a little bit more about some of the exciting advances that you've seen in the properties of these materials? Some of the examples include, certainly the most obvious example is manipulating the mechanical properties. So what we discovered on these individual nanobillers in my uh, work as a PhD student is that when you reduce the dimensions of typical common metals, their strength changes. Sometimes they can become stronger, sometimes they can become weaker, sometimes they can be no different. But if you understand how their microstructure operates together with these reduced external dimensions, you can manipulate and tune that strength and then construct things out of it. So imagine you now take a whole bunch of these nanopillars and you put them together into an architecture and all of a sudden it becomes much stronger than its fully dense components. So imagine that you have a chunk of copper, right? And then you imagine you're starting to bite chunks out of it like you would uh, in a Swiss cheese kind of a construct. And as you were doing it, you would expect this material to become weaker and weaker because it's a little bit like osteoporosis in your bone, right? So when your bones become more and more porous and more and more brittle, they become much weaker. But in this case, in the case of copper, as you're taking out more and more and more chunks and making your material more and more porous, it would actually become stronger. So that's very counterintuitive and very surprising and something to capitalize on because now imagine you can make anything from electrodes in a device to capacitors to various applications where heat conduction is important. And now they can be mechanically robust and just as conductive, but also much more lightweight. There's another example that I am particularly excited about. This is a little bit more of my dream world. I am very interested in creating smart textiles. So the architect and materials that we're creating, in some ways, they're a little bit like textiles, like fabrics, but they're so multifunctional, they can be made into like I already mentioned, ultra-sensitive capacitors that have a very sensitive and very uh, peculiar tactile response. They can also be made into 3D logic circuits. They can be made stimulus responsive in the sense that imagine you're wearing a shirt and when it's hot outside, the shirt is very open and so it lets the air in and so you feel cool or you feel comfortable. And imagine you then hop on a plane and you go to Alaska or you go somewhere where it's very, very cold. Now, because the temperature is dropped, your material is smart to respond to that stimulus of temperature and then to morph into a different shape such that it's now closed. And so the same shirt is now keeping you warm. So I see a lot of potential in these kinds of textile driven applications from bulletproof armor because they're also very, very lightweight, right? So from bulletproof armor, that is now very lightweight. So imagine a soldier can just wear something that's equivalent of just like a thermal shirt that will be just as bullet protective or will be just as impact protective, but will be significantly lighter than what exists currently. But basically looking at this world, which is very now by design and an enabling functionality through stimulus response and through something that you can push on something, for example, or the temperature can change, or it can become wet all of a sudden and it will protect you from the rain. I think that there's a lot of potential um, in those kinds of applications, and there's a lot of new science that needs to be done in that realm. And, and that's where the nanotechnology could really open up new avenues for doing that. You talked a little bit about the different types of properties that you create in your structures. What do you anticipate they'll be used for? Well, there are a few uses. So one that comes to mind uh, right away, and because we're here in Los Angeles, and so the shuttle, the space shuttle Endeavor, I think, is being um, housed in the California Science Center. So that shuttle is covered with many thousands of ceramic tiles. And those tiles are supposed to be lightweight. They're supposed to be extremely heat resistant and extremely mechanically resilient. So our materials do exactly that, but maybe at one thousandth of the weight. So think about how much savings you're going to get out of something that has all the same properties and all the same resilience, but now weighs a lot less. So what we demonstrated in our work last year was that they can be tuned to have either very low or very high thermal conductivity. And what that means is that they can conduct heat either much more readily or much less readily than what would be expected for that material. And not only are they capable of doing that, but they're also very, very stiff. And that is usually when you reduce the thermal conductivity, the penalty that you pay for that is that your structures become much more fragile. So think of something like an aerogel. So an aerogel will cl crumple in your hands because it's so, so fragile. It has all these beneficial properties, but it doesn't have any mechanical resilience. So what our materials offer are the thermal conductivity that's comparable to what you would expect from something that's fully dense, 
for example, uh, like the, the ceramics that the current space shuttle tiles are made out of. But now our materials are a thousand times lighter, but they're also just as stiff. I mean, you just talked a little bit about thermal properties and mechanical properties. Can you share your thoughts on interdisciplinarity. I mean, one of the things that nanoscience has really been credited with is bringing disciplines together because all of the interesting things are happening at these intersections. Can you share your experience from that perspective? That's actually a very, very, very important point, and I'm really glad that you brought this up. It is precisely doing that. The advent of nanotechnology and nanoscience is creating such a new and a much healthier enterprise of doing science. And I will give you a specific example of something very exciting. My students stumbled upon this and we're just starting to uncover it. What we discovered is that these materials can be dynamically tuned. So that gives rise to multifunctionality. So what we discovered is that you can apply a stimulus. Now that stimulus could be light, it can be heat, it could be electrochemical, it could be electrical. And that causes the material to morph into a different shape and to reconfigure itself. So you can create materials that are adaptive, that are smart, that are multifunctional. And of course, because of that, it requires the expertise from such a multitude of disciplines. So for example, if your stimulus is electrochemical, then there's definitely a contribution from the electrochemistry and chemistry in general. Now, if the response is mechanical, we definitely need the expertise of mechanical engineers, people and mechanics. If the response is shape changing, then we're going to need the expertise of people who build devices or maybe civil engineers or something like that if we're creating a structure and then looking at the configurational changes. We're definitely going to need the involvement of physicists who can predict the effect of defects, for example, right? So anytime you have a structure, anytime you have a material, the most important thing to understand, you cannot overestimate the role of defects because that's really ultimately what governs all the properties. And so by the time you get the physicists, the chemists, the material scientists, and the mechanics people involved, you are also dealing with engineers. And so that really brings together quite a few different expertises. And I should mention, they're very useful in biomedical engineering or just in my biomedical applications. So that of course brings in the bioengineering and the medical constituents all together. So this entire advent of, of nanotechnology is bringing together scientists and, and engineers from such a wide, broad range of expertise that the first level of interactions, of course, is always frustrating because we <laughs> don't use the same right. jargon and the same language. Like one particular example that we have is with the word substrate. So yes, yes. To I've, I've encountered to that one. Just, yeah, the word <laughs> substrate means something entirely different than what the word substrate means to us, and that is all the material science and mechanical engineers and nanotech people, which usually means silicon. So if you take a silicon wafer and then start depositing things onto it, it's called a substrate. But in biology, a substrate is usually some kind of a bacteria or something else that's just referred to, to a completely different to a completely different phenomenon and a completely different thing. So learning each other's language was very important. I just want to say I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us. And before we end, I want to give you the opportunity to share any closing thoughts that you might have for our listeners. I think it's very important for the scientists to communicate their science in a way that inspires the audience. And I think it's very important for the audience to just for common people to make the effort to try to understand. Our world is becoming so electronic and technology dominated that if we check out and we're lazy about understanding it, it's too addictive and it's too easy to get consumed by it. I think it's very important that we retain the common sense and the understanding that Alexa is not a human being, it's a technological device that was created by somebody. And all the virtual reality things and the YouTube videos and all of that, these are all virtual things that were created by engineers. And I think it's particularly important for our kids who are growing up in this world of touchscreen. My children think that every screen is a touchscreen. They don't understand the point of having a mouse. Right? <laughs> right. So I think everybody in that generation, they're perplexed by the mouse. So I think it's particularly because our kids are growing up in this world where everything is technology dominated and everything is technology driven. But the burden is on us, um, the scientists and, the, and parents, of course, is to explain where to draw the line between what's real and what's engineered and what, in, in that there is no magic in engineering and that this is all created by people like themselves and just 
people who think about problems and people who recognize that making a device involves this very multi interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary effort that is based on fundamental scientific discovery and is driven by people who have vision and imagination and who can inspire others to dream and to envision the world like it ought to be. And I think it's very important for the kids to know this and, and to set personal example, I certainly do that, to demonstrate what can be done if you get educated about these things, if, if you learn, if you put the effort in to learn about how things work. Thank you for joining us today for this special 15-year anniversary edition of Stories from the NNI. If you would like to learn more about nanotechnology, please visit nano.gov or email us at info at nnco.nano.gov and check back here for more stories.